Hello, welcome to another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob. I'm Wayne Highlander, National Sales Manager for Bona Adhesives. And I'm Rob Johnson from Bona Training. How you doing, Rob? Oh, I'm doing really good. I'm That's in good. Dallas right now. Just got in doing a school this week. Ready to kick it over tomorrow. Heat and humidity. It's hot in Dallas right now. It's only 102, but it's a dry heat. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. It's a dry heat. So um, isn't a blow. But so we we our episode today is going to be on um costly mistakes. And um before we do, Rob, I gotta tell you, I got a I got a, a new hobby. I kind of a, a twist on an old hobby. And um, you know, I um we talked about Gen Z recently. And uh, I'm at the age now where I got old friends. I remember when I was 50 and um, mine was turning 65 and he was, he was bummed out about it. You know, he's depressed. He goes, man, it just seems like 65, man. I mean, that's, it didn't return me, bother me when I turned 60, but now 65 just seems to hurt. And I remember saying, bothers you. What about me? My friend, my best friend is 65 years old. And how's that supposed to make me feel? How's that supposed to But I got, I've, I've been very fortunate in the last uh, year or so to uh, have a couple friends in my life that uh, one of them is uh, in his mid seventies, I'd say, and the other one is 80 years old. And I'm gonna tell you about these guys. I'm gonna tell you about this generation. So the one guy, um, you know, I told, I'll give you an example of what this guy's like. I told him I need a lawnmower, just in passing. My, the guy that mowed my lawns is graduated from college now. And so we either gotta hire somebody else to mow the lawns or, or I gotta do it myself. Um, or my sweet wife will have to do it when I'm away. But um, I, um, so I told this guy, I'm, I think I'm about buying a lawnmower. So he goes, okay, so you need to get one with a stamped deck. It needs to be blah, blah, blah. You got to make sure you do this. And um, and uh, when you get it, you got to bring it over to me because the, all the lawnmowers, all brand new lawnmowers, the, the, the blades aren't balanced properly. So you got to bring it to me and have the blade, you got to have the blade balanced. And then you got to sharpen the blades because you can't trust them that they got the blades really sharp. They don't really do a good job sharpening them. So uh, bring it over to me and I'll take that for you. And this guy, if I was to say to this guy, you know, like we said, hey, you know, we got tomato plants and uh, we're thinking about, you know, or, or, or we really like tomatoes and there's great tomatoes this year. He goes, oh, don't buy tomatoes anymore. I'm coming over to your house right now and uh, I'll show you where you need to plant them in your yard. Uh, you need some sticks. I mean, just boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? On the ball. It's a super good guy, man. And and um, another guy I was telling him, this guy's 80 years old. I met him at the gym. And if you would ask me how old is this guy, I would have said, maybe he's 70, right? As it turns out, he's 80. I told him I really like, yeah, I like fishing. And he goes, you like trout fishing? I said, yeah. He introduced me to a new style. Well, new to me. He's got these little boats that, you, that goes down the rivers. You know what I mean? It's a certain boat. And when I told him that, yeah, all right, that's, that sounds pretty cool. So the next day he goes, here's the boat you need to buy. It's like a, it's like a kayak, modified kayak. He goes, all right. So the next day he goes, did you buy the boat? I said, no. He goes, well, I found one for you in Portland, Oregon. All right. So here it's on eBay. Here's the guy's number here. You got to call it. And the next day is, okay, did you call it? All right. Well, cause we're going to go on the 13th and you're going to have to get this anchor and here, get the, I mean, you know what I mean? You know, like, you know, I, I get used to so many people go, yeah, man, we'll hook up later with we'll this, blah, blah, blah. But these guys are boom, man. They're, I mean, they say they're going to do something, they do it. You know what I mean? So I, the hobby that I have with this guy, uh, we go, we go trout fishing now down these rivers and these little boats, it's like a kayak, except for it's more portable and I can stand up wherever I need to stand up, you know, and I can walk around in it. And, um, it's added a whole new dimension of fishing to me because when I get in these, in these rivers, you're, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know what I mean? And you, 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 you just go about and all you hear, you go around the bend and all you hear is the paddle hitting the water. And, and it's just, uh, you know, you're going back behind farmlands and stuff like that. And it's just peaceful, man. Is it peaceful? Oh, it's just, it couldn't, it couldn't be any more peaceful. So, um, all you hear is the farm animals, the, the mother nature, and I tell you, Rob, it's heaven. Going back behind farms, you're out in the nature. And this, this guy doesn't hear very well. He's, he lost his hearing in Vietnam. And, and sometimes you get separated. And I'll say, 
you know what? Back in that last area there, I caught, I caught three trout. And he'll say, I know, but it's going to clear up once the sun comes out. You know what I mean? You can't hear, can't hear it to save your life. But uh, super good fisherman, man. And uh, he's just like, it's just like having your own personal guy. It's heaven. But the tranquility of being just down there in the rivers, you know, off by yourself, out in the middle of nowhere, to me, it's as good as it gets. You do that type of fishing at all? Never. <laughs> really? No, we Come just to see where I should take you. I'll have to go with you sometime. All right. Um, the rivers are pretty deep, though, man. I mean, we... We get out there, it's back in the middle of nowhere. Are you, are you fishing in the Nile now? You would think. It, it's, it's out there. So, so peaceful. Did I just hear a monkey? You might have. I said yeah, it's I way, I just heard way, a monkey. Yeah. way out there. In the... All in Tennessee, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's your new thing. You go around to the gym, you meet these lonely old men who have no friends. That's and, it. And now you're floating down rivers with them and oh. and taping all the sound sound effects too. That's awesome. It's that's, heaven. Yes, <laughs> for you. There's a, there's a train that goes over top where we fish and we float right underneath it. I'm telling you, Bob, it's, it's just as good as it gets. You, well, you should be the new Fred on the Howard Stern show with all these uh, sound gags, man. You're this is amazing. That's yeah. what two years will do, huh? Yeah. Two years doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Costly mistakes, Rob. Um, oh, lot, costly lot, mistakes. There's nothing when, worse. When you said this one, how, how many popped into your head? Several, they, they came fast. <laughs> yeah, it is. That is exactly. Oh my yep. God. Yeah, I, I'm not even talking floor mistakes. I mean, property mistakes. Yeah. Well, and that's why you need to make a profit on all your jobs, right? Because not everything's going to come out perfect every time. And there, not everything is going to, there's going to be a hiccup here and there. There's going to be, you're going to make a mistake here and there. You might damage something. Uh, gosh, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story real quick that um, I, there was a retail store in, in California and I, I didn't do much work for them and all, but I was friends with the owner and he his basically had the guys who got kind of kicked off the job. It was a very difficult home order to work with. And um, uh, so things weren't going right. And he goes, look, I can't, I don't want to send the guys back there because this guy is kind of hostile. I said, all right, man, I get it. I got my own thing going. I really don't want to get involved with this, but I kind of like this person. I thought, all right, man, I'll, I'll go there and I'll, I'll, I'll take it up, take care of it. It was just putting a few more pieces of molding back on, some little bit of trim work, and, and you're done, right? So when I, when I got there, when I got there, he had a, he had a glass door in front, real expensive, nice glass door. And he came out and he's meeting with me. He goes, oh, so they sent somebody else. Huh? I said, look, yeah, I understand. I, I kind of get the background story here. Uh, just so you know, I'm not involved in any of that, but uh, I, I do understand that, you know, what needs to be done. I, I've got given the punch list, but you and I will walk through it. So make sure we're both on the same page. And he liked me, right? We got along and, and he goes, yeah, he felt finally, you know, I feel like we're going to get this thing done. So, you know, when you, when you take your, uh, the hose and you, you, uh, you connect it to the compressor, you know, that connection, we, we plug it in there. Yes. Yeah. And, Compressor sitting by the door. I go to plug that thing in there. It slips out the back of my hand, hits the window, and shatters the window, uh, the door window, all the pieces in a million pieces. I turn around, I looked at him. I was like, man, nothing, nothing needs to be said, man. I said, hey, to give me a bill, and uh, that. So yeah, that was my. That was probably my number one worst. And you know, I had a dream the other night. I, I, as long as I've been out of doing floors, I had a dream the other night that I was doing a floor. It's, it's the weirdest thing. And it's always a problem floor when you're in my dreams. You know, you ever have those dreams? I, uh, it's spooky. Yeah. And Pauline can tell when I've had those dreams. I always have a dream of working for my uncle again. Oh, and darn. screwing things up. 
And I, there's been so many times where I'm having a dream of working for him, doing some kind of bowling alley thing. And in the dream, I'm thinking, I don't even work for him anymore. I don't even yeah. do this anymore. Sometimes that's what wakes but, you but up. But I got to get stuff done. Yeah, Pauline thinks that I need to definitely seek help. But yeah, I have that dream. I have those working dreams a lot. Yeah, from, uh, they don't. It's weird how family they don't business go dream. Yep. All and right. It wasn't so, like he was mean or anything. It was just asking me to do things. I'm like, I, I really don't have. I, but you have to. It's, it's a weird dream. Yeah. I, uh, let's. In my dream, nothing, it doesn't make sense. Logically, like I would never do that. I would never be in that situation, but it's always a quandary that I'm, when I'm in the dream, like, man, and I'm having to fight my way out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, <laughs> yes, that is, but it's always my uncle. Um, it's always a my uncle on a bowling alley thing. Oh, pretty yeah, funny. Crazy. All right. Yeah. Costly mistakes. Rob, what's a costly mistake? And actually, oh. The first Before one that came to my head, first one that came, like that one that we blew the window out. Mm -hmm. As soon as you say some mistakes, the first one that popped into my head, Pete and I are doing it floor, and I'm running the buffer. Now, it was old time buffers. Now, you know that the buffers of today, right? They have a safety switch to turn the handle on, right? Mm -hmm. You got to do whatever yeah. unlock it so you can well the old buffers remember you had like a cruise control on it you could pull the handle and then push the button down and would lock that yeah. handle in and you didn't yeah. have to hold the handle anymore right mm -hmm. you remember those you don't oh, think you see those anymore right yeah yeah you run the buffer all day long well i went too far on some in one of the rooms yanked the cord out so I, Pete was in that room. I go, hey, Pete, give me a favor, plug me back in, will you? And as soon as I said that, I turned and walked away from the buffer. Like, wow. to, to really do something stupid, like go stare out the window or something. It wasn't even, you know, I wish I could say I jumped down to scrape corners or what. No, just walked away from it. Oh, he plugs cool. that thing in, and that buffer took off, spinning, spinning, spinning. And just by about a foot, missed going through um, a built-in china cabinet, but it did go right through uh, a plastered wall. Oh, Huge wow. hole in it. You want to see something funny? You see a buffer stuck in the wall. Look like uh, look like a piece of modern art. You know. That's that's brutal. Yeah, that was a good old one. Buffers, them old buffers were like that, though, man. I remember them. You put that switch on, and uh, you just you could just cruise. It had cruise control on it. It was a nice feature, but it was kind of a uh, it wasn't really safe. And I bet right. every floor man, every floor man out there listening to this has seen somebody do this one. It was funny because I saw, it was the first time Bum did it. He yanked the cord out when he was edging one day. And it's not the buffer. It, well, you know, if you do that with a Bona edge, mm -hmm. if you pull the cord out, the switch turns itself off automatically. But we were using the old Clark edger, right? So we flip the switch. Well, he goes running over, plugs the machine in, plugs the edger in. And of course, it just started, you know, spinning. Mm -hmm. Pulls the cord right out of his hand. I wasn't upset. I thought it was kind of funny. And I said, that's the quickest way I ever saw anybody roll up an edge of cord in my life. That was a good idea. I said, but you know, <laughs> but the look on his face, he's probably around 12 years old. Oh, my God. Uh, the look on his face when that thing just shot out of his hand. Nice. All right. I'm going to tell you one that uh, that is actually quite common, Rob. Uh, and again, these are costly mistakes. And uh, one of them, and this actually um, comes from Brian Rathbun, our territory manager out in the Rocky Rocky uh, Mountain region in Colorado, uh, is rushing the stain and coating too soon. And I think everybody's been in that situation where you you know you walk into a floor, it was stained last night, you've got to get that coat on. You walk in, and you you can tell by the smell, right? It just still smells a little bit too strong. It's a little bit too tacky underneath your feet. And um, you start thinking, oh, man, I, I got to get this thing coated tonight or today. And um, and you go ahead and, and uh, coat it anyhow, hoping for the best. A lot of times you can tell as you're coating that, you know, you'll, you, this, you'll get stain. The stain will pull up in your finish. 
was a pretty good indication that, yeah, this probably wasn't, well, it wasn't dry. <laughs> um, those you don't sometimes pay for until down the road, right? Where, okay, well, looks like maybe we got a wave or whatever, but, you know, so likely you could have a soft finish, you could have peeling issues down the road or what have you. So that's one that's quite common. And it's just, uh, as we say, uh, sometimes it's, you just got to know when you got to, you, you know what, you got to schedule, they got to schedule, but you just, you got to honor the, honor the dry time. One of our commandments. You know, um, since we mentioned stains and caused some mistakes, we have to mention stain rags. Yeah. Because we've just talked to too many people. We know too many people that have been, you know, had some serious mistakes, costly mistakes with stain rags. So I'll give you the quick, the quick version of what we do in the schools, okay? Um, Mother Nature, when we have, when you use a stain, you're gonna have three types of oil in it, usually three types of oil, okay? Linseed, soybean, vegetable oil. So those are natural products, right? They're, that's Mother Nature stuff. So when stain is used, when oil is used, one of those three oils is used, it's Mother Nature's job to dry that oil. Okay, and she's going to dry it one or two ways. She's going to dry it with air or she's going to dry it with heat. Okay, so if you take those stain rags and you lay them out and let them dry just in the air outside, even, you know, if you lay them on the floor inside, they'll eventually dry. But if you take those rags and you ball them up and put them in a bag or a bottle, you know, bag of dust or whatever but you take away the air, mother nature is gonna to start to generate heat. And that generating heat is called oxidation, which mother nature is actually producing oxygen to, dry the, to try to dry that oil. That oxidation, that heat leads to spontaneous combustion. Wayne, it just, it's all mother nature stuff. It can't not happen if you don't take care of those stain rags. Anybody but, who's getting the NWFA, um, not the NWFA, but any of the wood floor magazines or the emails and everything, man, you're almost seeing this once a month now where somebody has had a major fire due to stain rags. You know, back in our day or back in I, my day when I was doing floors full time, 10% of my jobs were stained. I was talking to Bum the other day and he said 90% of his jobs are stained. So that's why we're seeing so many more issues with stain rags compared to the old days, just because everybody is putting colors on the floor now. So, you know, it's definitely something to talk about with your guys. Like I said, we're on the subject of stain. So I have to talk about stain rags and stain rag fires. But Rob, it's cold outside. <laughs> it's freezing out. I mean, it's, you know, it's wintertime. It's cold outside. Doesn't matter one bit of difference. We saw a stain rag fire in a bag that was on a snowbank. Yeah. Temperature has nothing to do with it. It's chemical. Okay. Yep. You have an accelerant on that rag. You take away the air and that's just going to generate enough heat. Be because that oxidation so leads to spontaneous combustion. Yeah, because there's so many ways to get distracted on on a job. Um, I think that um, it, it's smart. And towards the end of my career, it was a habit of mine, anyhow, to like when your job is done at the end of the job, take ten minutes, and sit down, or walk the job, and with a pencil and paper, and I, you know, have a checklist that you go through in your head. Now, one of them is what am I going to need tomorrow that I don't have on the job now, right? Do I need it? Did I do I need to bring some more spline or slip tongue? You know what I mean? Do I have enough paper for the job for tomorrow? Is there anything else I need to bring? Is there another tool that maybe I need to bring? Take 10 minutes and just 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 slow down and just come to a just stop and start thinking the job through. That 10 minutes could could save you a tremendous amount of time uh, on on the, the next day. But one of those things is is uh, where's the stain rags? When you have multiple people on a job, especially. Like if there's one person on a job, you know, it's more likely that 
you know that's your responsibility. <clears throat> two or three or four people on a job, it's very easy to think, well, Bob's going to get it, right? I'm doing this. I'm rolling up the cords now, so I'm sure he's going to get it. But um, so, and as we get older, you know what I mean? To multitask a lot of things, maybe, maybe like to the younger guy, it might be carelessness. An older guy, it might be, you know what, I'm, uh, you know, I'm multitasking to all these different things, but uh, it slipped my mind. It becomes just like, just like when you're doing repetitious cuts with the table saw, boom, 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 boom. You're doing them every time, boom, boom. It's just automatic and then automatic. You don't even have to think about it anymore. And then bang, the, 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 you get hit by the blade. Uh, I, so I think that taking that 10 minutes at the end of every day on a job uh, is a, a valuable habit to get into. So yeah, staying, uh, rushing the stain, honor the dry time, I think is uh, very important. And, um, you know, we've all gone out to those inspections down the road where the floor is is soft. It never really set up like it like it could have, or it gets a cloudy look to it or whatever down the road. So taking the time, I mean, yeah. gosh, some of these things now dry relatively fast. I mean, back in the old days, man, it was, you know, eight hours, you know, if you're lucky. And, you, and also, by the way, when, you know, we, as we say, when you water pop the floor, if it was if on the can, it says two hours, that's out the window now. Right, you've opened up those those pores in that in that uh, wood, and and it, it, it's really going to drive in the heavy pigmented stain if you're going really dark. Um, and the dry time is what it says on the can is out the window. That that can of stain is the same can of stain in January as it is in August. Same can of stain as as it as it is in Florida as it is in Arizona. It's just the elements that uh, that we have to understand and we're working with. So, yep. You know, right. uh, I just want to touch on a little bit what you had said about um, older guys and younger guys. Mm -hmm. When we have new guys at the trainings, you know, at our the bonus schools, bonus training schools, I tell that to everybody. Uh, that's the guy you really have to watch is the new guy. You know, labor right now, everybody's trying to get new guys so that is one of the things that we try to tell all the new guys and tell tell owners of companies and everything. This is something that you really have to watch with this guy who's first or second day on the job. He's just going to want to do something, you know, cleaning up, taking care of things, whatever. He wants to be part of the crew. He wants to help. So he's the guy that you really have to talk to about stain rags because you know, if he's new to the business, he's probably not going to, you know, haven't, hasn't heard about anything like this. So he needs to be trained. He, you well, need to tell well. him exactly, man, these things are powder kegs. So have to be very careful with them because, you know, well, a new guy, well. he's going to look to just bury that stain rags down in some bag of rubbish or something and just got to have that talk with him. Well, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't you got to hear that echo back. No, um, I wasn't going to mention this too, but you, you talk about fire safety. You got you kind of go down that rabbit hole. You also have to talk about vacuum cleaner bags. Cool. You know that, especially those little vacuum cleaners that with the uh, uh, the backpack vacs, where uh, you're, you're 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 vacuuming between coats. You have all those solvents and everything, and you got the motor underneath it that's hot. That bag, especially the more full it gets, the hotter it gets. We talked about those before, making sure those are taken care of, and. You also in the communication, you talk about the new guy. If you were to say, hey, go take care of those stain rags. Well, what does that mean to a, to a guy that doesn't know anything about the trade? You know what I mean? That may throw him in the dumpster or what does that mean? So, yeah. All right. Exactly. All right. All right. All right, Rob, what do you got? What do you got? Next? Let me go next. Documentation. Uh, yep. Documentation. Uh, I mean, I, I, it killed me on a job. We uh, installed a wood floor in a kitchen. I think I've even told this story before. Installed a wood floor in a kitchen. I mean, we knocked this thing out of the park. It was perfect. And the lady came and she's like, yeah, the floor looks great, but you really dinged up my cabinets really bad. And uh, I said, no, we didn't, we didn't touch your cabinets. We made absolutely sure that we didn't. You know, you can see those are old scratches and bent. And she's like, no way. She knew for a fact in her heart that we had done that to her cabinets, but her floors were trashy. So she was never really looking down. She never took a close look at her cabinets. We didn't touch the cabinets. And there were certain spots I was even like, we didn't even come close with a gun or anything in here. You know, this, but we didn't document anything. We didn't take a picture. Well, back then we didn't have the cameras and stuff that we have now. So 
That's another thing that we talk about in the training class. Boy, when you see something, take a picture of it. See a split in a door or crack, whatever, holes, whatever you see. Take pictures, document this stuff, because if you don't, you're going to lose. The person who doesn't have the documentation is going to lose every time. Yeah, and um, you know, especially you know, you're working around a marble countertop or something sensitive of that nature, or you kind of get a feel for the customer. Um, man, if you show that scratch on a natural finished floor, and your job you you was a you know uh, like an ebony color floor when you're done, well, how could we put the scratch there if it was there? And the, uh, when you know what I mean, it shows here before you can see the picture of the color of the floors before we started, and this is what's here now, and so. Yeah, all important stuff, man. You're at a big disadvantage when you're in someone else's home on as to what's what what happened and what didn't happen, right? Because you're in their home. I mean, you know, what's who, who's going to believe the your story versus theirs? So, document, document, document. Um, putting traffic or mega down too thin, which leads to streak and scuff marks and less durability. Yeah, I I think that's something to be you know um, costly mistakes. Um, nothing happens worse than having to do another coat that you didn't anticipate having to put on. Uh, it's much better than knock the two coats out and do them, do them, hit the coverage rate and everything, than having to come back and 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 you know when you didn't anticipate putting a floor on. That's a costly mistake, and um, a lot of the time it is. It's just hitting the coverage rates. And the thing about that is, is once you get used to hitting a certain coverage rate, you're used to a certain look that the finish has, right? You know how it's going to look and how it's performing. If you start altering that, you know, trying to change it from one way to the other, or try to put up this coat on a little heavier for whatever reason, or a little lighter for whatever reason, you kind of don't have that that bar to judge by all the time about how it's going to look. So I, I think that's very important that make sure you're consistent on the coverage rates. Frankly, when I roll, I put my finish on heavier than when I T-barred. I know that about, about my coating style. Um, but I always try to hit the – and I would uh, – um, go through from time to time and, and measure it and see that I really, you know, I, I figured two gallons or two and a half gallons. How close was I to that? That's what it should have been. If I'm veered off of that, well, why? And then you talk about putting streaks in the finish and that kind of stuff or, or early wear, those type of things. I mean, that that's all comes back as costly mistakes. Coverage rates, man. Coverage rates. I'll tell you another costly mistake it should be one of our commandments, honor thy inner coat abrasion guidelines. So that's interesting because I want to change one of the, uh, uh, one of our commandments and you want to change one of the commandments. Say that over I don't again. know if I want to change it, but I want to add it. And I know we tell everybody, you know, one of the commandments is read the directions. So you are going to get your inner coat abrasion uh, recommendations on there. But Man, oh man, I've seen some floors fail because people aren't following the inner coat abrasion recommendations. And, you know, when you're, especially with oil-based products, those are some pretty strong recommendations. If you're going to smooth out a floor using a maroon pad, you got to remember a maroon pad's only going to go about 350 feet. If you're, we had gym guys, if, you know, you're, intercoat abrading 2,000 feet. And we would get that more with custodial staffs, maintenance crews, okay, in a school where they're using young kids and they buff out 2,000 feet using a maroon pad and not flip it. But nobody was really talking to them, explaining to them how important this intercoat abrasion really is. All of this really, boy, that's a costly mistake. So um, I think that's why education is so important because um, you can say, yeah, you hit it with a maroon pad. Okay. Did you hit it with a maroon pad? Yeah, you did. Yes. Like you said, yes. Look at the coverage rates. I say the same thing about um, when you're buffing on stain. Uh, you know, when we used to wipe off stain, you know, we had an expression, you need to wipe off like a man. In other words, you need to put your, put your, put your, your muscle into that stain, wiping it off. Right. Sometimes on a water pop floor and a heavy pigmented floor, you know, I'd be putting, I'd be ragging it on. Uh, my brother would be ragging up behind me and then we'd have a guy coming by behind him. And he was just a cleanup guy, right? Making sure you're getting all that pigment off the floor. I've seen guys buff floors, buff stain on, 
and uh, use one pad to put it on and really not buff it off. And yeah, you stain the floor and what have you, but man, that's a lot of pigment left on the floor. Now you can come back the next day and take a white rag and put it on the floor for 60 seconds and then kind of wipe it with your hand on it and see what transfer you're getting. Was that stain really dry? When we look at costly mistakes and we took it about, talk about white lines in the finish, especially on the end joints is an indication of, of that perhaps that, that stain wasn't dry. So uh, just for a lot of different reasons, man, um, honoring the dry time, I think is huge and coverage rates is good. And just cause you wiped off, you know, it doesn't make sure it doesn't mean you wiped off properly or just cause you buffed the floor. doesn't mean you buffed the floor properly. I mean, that's where the uh, you're looking at the spread rates and really drilling down into that floor and really being a part of that floor and not going through the motions is, uh, um, is so important. Hmm. You feel me? I feel you, brother. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Jeff Sheaves, our territory manager down there in uh, the great state of Virginia and then uh, that part of the world, said adding additional layer of plywood subfloor and ran screws into water line placed in between the joists, flooded the basement. Um, yeah, I, I, I uh, got a job one time and I looked at the job and the homeowner wanted me to do the floors over and they were obviously brand new floors, 516 top nail floors. And um, he said, I need to have a bid to replace all these floors and put new floors in. And I'm walking around looking at floors and they look beautiful. I mean, they just they had to be, you could almost smell the finish. You know what I mean? They were beautiful. And I said, well, I got to be honest with you. Something must have gone on here. I said, because these floors look, look pretty good. He goes, okay, I'll, I'll come here, follow me for a minute. And he took me downstairs. And then whoever nailed that floor off, nailed it with two inch nails. And the nails came through the downstairs, which by the way, was a finish downstairs. You know what I mean? It was nice. Yeah. It, yeah. And uh, instead of using the one inch nails, that's, that's you're supposed to, uh, they shot two inch nails all through the, through the, uh, through the uh, subfloor and the, the ceiling of the floor uh, uh, underneath it. So ugly mistake, man. You know, knowing what you're getting into, you know, same thing, um, and Jeremiah Strong noted that, if, you know, if you're using two-inch cleats and you're blowing through the plywood, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of guys have turned to using 540 uh, for sealers on primers or, or sealers on their subfloor for moisture protection. Um, but it doesn't make sense to me to use two-inch staples at times when you're going to blow through the bottom side of it, right? I mean, just for me... Um, why not go to the inch and a half staples or, or the smaller staples so you're not going out the other side of that plywood? So, you know, just things. Well, it wasn't, uh, you know, that kind of happened to me, but it wasn't on a floor. Well, I guess it was on a floor. It wasn't on a floor I was getting paid to do, though. My brother bought this boat. I boat? found this boat. Yeah, I found this boat. I have a boat. And I know my brother was looking for a boat. So I found this boat really nice you know open bow you know what i mean merc cruiser the whole deal really brand new motor good boat he buys it and he goes i had a i gotta get a new floor so i'm thinking how tough can it be to put a floor in a boat i'm a floor man been doing floors all my life he got a price from somebody to put a new floor in I think it was like three grand. So I said, Chris, we can do that in a weekend. You and I, forget about it. Easy. And we did. We ripped out everything, going to town on it. And I'm thinking, man, I am the smartest freaking. I can do anything. I really can do anything. So we replaced the ribs and I'm screwing the plywood on top, right? Everything is going as smooth as silk. And then Bum walks up. Now, the boat's in my backyard, right? Mm -hmm. And he is just, we just couldn't be happy. We just can't, you know what I mean, right? We just yeah. can't wait yeah. to get out. And you and I'm walking on it like, look at this freaking floor. It's perfect, right? So Bum comes walking up, and he was younger at the time. And he goes, did you guys mean to have these screws coming out the side of the boat here? Oh, no. Oh, so I... I started laughing, right? I go, oh, pretty yeah. funny. His pretty kid's got a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah, he's got my sense of humor, exactly. He wasn't. 
I did. I screwed. <laughs> oh my, oh god. my god. You want to see. I can't uh, believe that I did it. I was using four inch screws and they came through about an inch and a half right through the, but it wasn't at the bottom. It was kind of out on the side. You know what I mean? Where the yeah. side of the boat kind of meets the, the bottom there. Yeah. I just, just missed it, you know, and put a whole row in. There was like nine screws sticking out the bottom of his boat. You pick up the so then I looked at him, I go, well, we really can't, you know, do anything to it because if we pull them out, you'll sink, you know. He's like, you know what, you've you've done enough. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your help. <laughs> oh man, that's brutal. Was it a, a friend you said or a relative? It's my brother. Oh. <laughs> he still has that boat. He said, well, he still has that well, boat today. He doesn't want to put it in the water. No, no, no. He's he's brought it to a complete professional. Anything that needs to be done, do not bring it to Robbie. Bring it yeah. to a professional. Wow. And the boats never run better. Wow. But man, what a sick feeling that was. Um. Okay, so real quick, I gotta say you're in Texas this week. I was in Texas last week. Um, I was there till Friday. I stayed Saturday. I have a good friend that was down there. Uh, Bassmasters. Uh, uh, tournament was down there at uh, one of the lakes down there. So went to the Bass Masters uh, the Saturday and Sunday. We had a guide to fish on Lake Fork. And um, Lake Fork is a bucket list. Anybody who's into bass fishing would know Lake Fork, Texas. Okay, that is like a month. That's the factory of, of big bass in that lake. And um, I mean, I, I, a lot of guys I don't like. I've, I've had guys before and I'm not necessarily a fan of a lot of guys, whatever, but this guy was awesome, man. He goes, man, I've been crappie fishing for two days. I can't wait to get on the bass. I'm on them right now. I, I, I mean, they are there. It is time. It's been raining for two weeks. The forecast, five days of sunshine, man. This is awesome. I've been waiting for this day. Fantastic, man. We got in the boat with him. Flying down the lake. Get about three miles out there. I look at this guy. It cannot be any blacker, right? And uh, he slows down and goes, man, he goes, look at that, man. Isn't my, I got to take a picture of this. Look at Mother Nature. It's beautiful, isn't it? It looked to me like we're getting ready to have a tornado, you know, but I'm thinking, all right, I'm not from Texas. Maybe, you know, and this guy's not too worried about it. And while he's got his phones out, he looks at the weather screen. He goes, oh, my God. He goes, look, and it shows like like the death storm is coming, right? And then there's boats coming towards us, and one of them flashed, flashed his lights at, at him. And he goes, I know that guy. He goes, hey, we got a bail, man. We turned around and Rob, within 10 minutes, it was a it was a torrential, I mean, like a downpour like you've never seen before in your life. And worse than that, obviously, it was the lightning. You know what I mean? The thunder and lightning. You can fish in the rain. You can fish in whatever. But the lightning is a deal breaker. Rob, I had been waiting for this trip for six months. I never I never made the first cast on that lake. Oh. We waited around for another three and a half hours, and it just never happened. So anyhow, I'm sorry. You just brought up that, that boat and remind me of fishing. All right. Uh, Stainless steel appliances, such as refrigerators, are easily damaged. They're hard to repair if you scuff or, or change the sheen on them. That is real, man. I tell you what, um, you got to be very careful with stainless steel appliances. Very careful. And I, I don't you make sure you don't scuff them. Uh, don't put your hands on them. Don't put dirty hands on them. Don't get adhesive on it. Be very careful with those appliances because they're expensive. And um, they're very easy to scuff. And they're very hard to uh, to get the sheen right if you do. So, man, we used to tell our guys, be deathly afraid of those. Uh, and I would, if they had scuffs on them, that's where I would take pictures of or take a video of. Because I don't want to buy a refrigerator uh, for something like that. So, big time, uh, big time, easy, easy target to cause you a problem on a job. We had a huge screw up and it could have been uh, even a worse disaster. We were doing, this guy built this huge log cabin. And he used those two by four plank floors type, you know, like the tongue and groove pine. Yep. Everything looked great, you know, we're sanded it. We start pulling the upstairs, we're doing poly. And the guy came in about halfway through, we were done and he starts screaming. Stop, 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 stop. He's screaming at us. I didn't even think he was talking to us. I thought he might've been talking to somebody else, right? 
it is pouring rain of polyurethane. I mean, it is running through. And the only thing that's, I mean, it was a disaster, right? It was a cleanup nightmare. Yeah. But the only yeah. thing that saved us was we had draped all the uh, appliances because we had been sanding, you know, and that's from back when we were using bags and everything. So we just draped everything. So everything was covered in plastic. Well, but if God. we had not covered that, those appliances in plastic, it could have cost us thousands of dollars. Wow. But Holy I smokes. never saw anything. I never saw it was it was polyurethane rain in this wow. whole downstairs. Well, you just re, uh, you know, uh, talking about refrigerators, uh, this came to my mind also is, uh, is the uh, insidious leaks that you get from ice makers. We never, never, never hook up an ice maker. Um, uh, you know, we had air sleds, like a lot of guys have those air sleds, which is, by the way, one of the best tools you, you know, that's another don't leave home without it type, type of tool. Um, but flat out, do not hook up ice makers. Nope, nope, nope. We'll never do it. By the time you find out it's leaking, it's caused so much damage. It's so easy to leak. I mean, you're the last guy that touched it. You know what? It's not. It's never worth it. I, I strongly urge people not to uh, to hook up ice makers. Have you ever Any, popped one? Pardon me. Have you ever popped one? Uh, no. One? No. No. I don't believe I have. But uh, we've had our struggles with them, where they we couldn't stop them from. We couldn't really get them off or whatever. And, you know, we had to do that fireman drill that we didn't want to do, but never had a real disaster from it. But we uh, had a, we flooded out a, a kitchen and a dining room one time. We were pulling up the subfloor and I had rolled the refrigerator out so we could get the subfloor out of that. And I looked over at Pete and I said, hey, just uh, as I was pulling it out, I said, be careful on that pipe there. It's kind of tight. The words were still floating around in the air, okay? Mm -hmm. And he had just gone over and, you know, just that gave one last with just a little pull, right? Yeah. And the pressure of that water that was coming out. So we run downstairs to turn it off, right? You know, the little spigot that mm -hmm. little. They had their basement finished, oh. and the guy who did it, plywood or he finished that ceiling. Oh no. So we couldn't get to the turnoff. You're doomed. It just, there was no way to stop this water. It just kept coming. We finally had to go outside and turn the whole water thing off, the whole water main that was coming into the yeah. house. You should have beat the hell out of each other <laughs> and tied each other up and say you were robbed. Oh my God, but it was, was, we laugh about it now, but like I said, I said, hey Pete, watch out for that, watch out for the pipe. And hey, two, three, four seconds later, the water is sick. just shooting. Sick feeling, man. <laughs> I've had, uh, I pulled up in my grand, my grandparents, my, uh, my father-in-law's uh, driveway. And as I made the turn into his driveway, the stain spilled out of the side. It was in the lower part of the van, you know, where the door closes, that section there. And just, uh, you know, the van, the, the, the stain just started leaking out the sides. As I'm going up to meet them, I'm like waving like, hi. And I see him like go crazy. Like, you know, uh, and, and then she went like, oh, my God. And they're, they're like running around. And he goes, what are you doing? I mean, what are you, my driveway? Um. I never did to a customer, but but I had to get out the wire brush. I had to get out the the, the uh, poly the um, the uh, paint thinner. Um, it was a it was a nightmare. So you know, Easy. that's the thing. You know, you, in this trade, yeah, we've talked about we had the family and friend shows, and people liked that one, right? Mm -hmm. There was something I forgot to tell you about screwing up family and friends. There is not an occasion where my brother doesn't bring that up. See, yeah. The screws in the boat. Every, yeah. it doesn't, I, I can never win an argument for the rest of my life, okay? Because of what I did. Well, to that's the thing. Every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, when everybody's around the table and, oh yeah, let's talk about the screws in the boat. 
So, you know, that's the thing, you know, yeah, I, I, five, five generations, I've done this, this, I'm the, I'm yeah. a trainer, I do all this, I've been around the country, blah, blah, but you're never going to beat that screws in the boat story. You'll never live it down. Nah. Nah. What is the, what is the price of that worth? You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, might, maybe that's a good idea. See, I'll see if I can buy that story from him. You can't yeah. use that story anymore. Yeah. I bought it. I gave you three grand. Yeah. Right. But that's a good way. <laughs> okay. Um, this one here too is a, is one that could that's happened to a lot of people. That's easily that can happen very easily. You turn off the power somewhere, or you throw the wrong breaker. You go into a box. And, and you disconnect the, the wrong one and you got a refrigerator out, uh, a freezer out in the garage somewhere or, um, and all the food goes bad. You lose the power. So it very, you know, could happen very easily. That's why I say, you know, you charge three bucks a foot or four bucks a foot or two bucks a foot. You have to take in consideration the risk and liability that's in this job. If you're in this job for any length of time, you are going to screw up somewhere, somewhere. Knock on wood, it's not bad, but somewhere you're gonna, it's gonna cost you some money to be in business. So that's when we talk about having to charge for things, that's another reason why you have to. A freezer full of uh, of bad meat is uh, is expensive. Now let's say the guy goes deer hunting once a year up to Wisconsin, right? He has all the, the meat processed, he comes home. That's just not just food, that's, that's his food that he went out and killed like a man, you know what I mean? And um, you've destroyed it. So there's not there's not a there's not a good looking coat out enough out there to 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 beat that uh, replace that guy. That? Did you ruin a guy's? No, I, and, and I'm 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 not a saint, man. I'm trying to think of if I've uh, if I've ever done that, and I I just can't Rob, remember that we've ever done that. Uh, we've had our share of mistakes. Everybody has, but I don't think I've ever done that. Um. But very easy, man. I mean, it could happen very easy. Uh, uh, one thing we, I used to say, we would turn the uh, refrigerator down very low when we were coating so that air didn't kick off when we were coating. So I was always concerned that, um, you know, that would be an issue that we forget something like that. You know what I mean? And by the way, we're talking about refrigerators. Another mistake that people make is if you're going to remove that refrigerator out of the room, say down some stairs or whatever, you tilt that refrigerator back, you can destroy the refrigerator. You can ruin that refrigerator and end up having to buy a refrigerator. Refrigerators are not supposed to ever be tilted backwards like that. So, really? Yeah. So, um, you know, that you, very, very easily that you could, you could have them buy a refrigerator for that reason, too. So all these things, man. Um, cost you see, mistakes. this show just isn't about wood floors. No. We're teaching you how to repair boats, how to repair refrigerators. It's about screw ups. It's like. We could do a nine hour show on screw ups or I could. Yep. Yep. I bet there's some good screw up stories. If you're listening, send us your good screw up story. We could put yep. a book together. Um, not using wood filler. Um, and, um, you know, ending up with uh, peaked seams. If you're flooding a floor, that first coat of, uh, of a sealer or whatever, and you're and using a lot of finish, say you're rolling on a lot of finish and it's a thin floor um, and you don't have wood filler down there or you get bleed back sometimes uh, because of that or poly beads down the road. Uh, so wood filler can help you in a lot of different ways. Just got a picture of a floor from somebody today that uh, uh, the guy had two coats on and they're wondering what the different, what what's going on with that floor. Um, it looks cloudy in certain areas and whatever. And when I really dive in and look at that floor, it's it's wood filler that did not all get sand off in that last pass. Um, we stopped using a hundred grit to sand off our wood filler for that reason. I just didn't feel like it was it was, you know there was a, there was an opportunity there that would that it would leave some of that filler on the floor and um, on a natural finish or whatever, and you wouldn't quite see it or whatever. And then it shows up later over time. A lot of lot of you know what I mean. It's just. Um, it's a thinking person's game, this business, uh, because you can say it's simple. I mean, you, you, you go through the steps, you get the results, but the step isn't just a step, right? It's a step done properly. Um, we always say that uh, everything you do should complement what you're getting ready to do next, right? And um, just because you, like you said, just because you've, you know, you, you vacuumed the floor doesn't mean you vacuumed the floor. Just because you've, 
you know, stained the floor doesn't mean you hit the right coverage because, because you abraded the floor. It doesn't mean you've really abraded it properly because maybe you use a 320 and you try to do 800 feet with it. I mean, so there's a lot more to this than, uh, than a, a lot of people that's not in this trade realize. We had this so old guys, guy who was uh, kind of the trainer on my dad's crew. And he had a saying, you can't be a robot when you're sanding floors. Yeah. He goes, you just can't be a robot. You can't look at it like you're going to do the same thing every single day where you think you're going to be doing the same thing every day. But all these jobs have curveballs and you have to look at them individually. Can't be a that, robot. That is one of the best things I've ever heard. I love that. Because I used to say, you can sand the floor like you're mowing a lawn, right? You're just going behind the sander. You're, not, you're just not thinking, you whatever, but I do it every day. You're not even thinking about it. Or you can look at the floor. You can read the floor. And that floor will tell you what it needs, right? And you'll start realizing the really small, small, small details from one job to the other that make it successful or not successful. Uh, if yep. you care that much, you know what I mean? We'll wrap it up here. There's a lot of different ways. It's just this... Uh, just thinking about a few things out there that can cause you, and maybe they'll kind of make you think about um, so how, there's pitfalls out there, right? I used to I always say that, you know, if we look at what we have on our side of the equation going for us, if we look at here's 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 everything on our side of the equation, and then if we look at things that are going that could potentially go against us, it's a it's the list is a mile long. So at the end of every day, when you take take ten minutes to yourself, sit down at the end of the day and think the job through, what you're going to need the next day, and and uh, just kind of be careful. There's a lot of pitfalls out there, um, and uh, we don't want anything to distract from our our, our uh, schedules and beautiful jobs and, and what we love to do with this trade. So there you go, Rob. All right, this has been another episode of On the Floor with Wayne and Rob. Please stay tuned for another episode.